My wife, Karen, recently told some girlfriends that I was, used to be, a 325-pound alcoholic white male Republican. And folks, I'm happy to say, with great joy, can say that I have changed all those labels. And let me tell you that the journey that I took in order to do that was not only a long one, but was one with great learning. And the learning that I had that was probably the most important one was that I spent the first 60 years of my life with white male privilege, a privilege I didn't even know that I had until I lost it. I was having lunch one, one afternoon with some girlfriends. For Rampa, they were really more than girlfriends. They were kind of my mentors at work, my support group. We had been in meetings together all morning. And so we were sitting around at lunch and just, you know, kind of debriefing a little bit, chit-chatting. And I started to complain about how things had changed for me in meetings. In particular about this one event that happened that morning. I had put out an idea, and it was ignored, something that never used to happen. And... I said, okay, I take just a few minutes, I'm talking a very few minutes later, a man stood up, we normally never stood up in these meetings, a man stood up, said the exact same words, and all of a sudden they were a great idea, and he gets credit for it. And I'm thinking, huh? And I couldn't believe that that had happened. And I'm sure most of the women out here in this audience have experienced something similar. Well, one of the girl, my girlfriends laughed and said, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> we have dealt with that our whole careers. And that's when it really hit me, that the experiences that I had had throughout my 38-year career were a whole lot different than what they had experienced through their career. And that I had had some advantages that, I, like I said, I didn't realize I had had. Well, what that did for me also was fuel my passion for advocacy. A passion that started back when I took care of that first issue, the 325 pounds, I did that using gastric bypass surgery. And without going into a lot of detail about what would all, all that kind of stuff around that, let's just say that it was successful and that not only did I become thinner, it resolved a number of comorbidities, other medical issues that I had that were related to my obesity. And because of the success that I had there, and because I was in pensions and benefits, so I knew that part of the, of the world, I was asked if I could go around the road and, and talk to other employers about covering gastric bypass surgery. And I did. I found that I liked it. And so shortly thereafter, I was in another meeting with some folks that uh, were getting ready to start a new organization. And this organization was to become the voice of those people affected by obesity, to advocate for access to care and against the stigma of obesity. I joined up immediately. I was member number six. That organization, over the 13 years, has had over about 70,000 members that have come through. And we get to go out, and they taught me how to advocate. They taught me how to take my story. And we went, took it everywhere. We went to Capitol Hill and did presentations there and talked to representatives and their, and, their, and their staffs. We talked to insurance companies. We talked to employers. We talked to medical conferences. We talked at national conferences. I even got to do an interview on the Today Show along with my wife, Karen. It was, it was amazing to learn those things. And you know what? We started to see change. And that was the most important part. Now, changes in that part of the world that I was advocating for weren't the only changes that were occurring over this time frame. So over about a 10-year period, starting in 2003 and heading on up to 2013, I started a process that I later deemed as micro-transitioning. I began to realize that my gastric bypass surgery was not only something that I did for my health, my physical health, but it also was something that I was doing for my mental health. It was probably the first step that I took in my transition. Although at that point in time, I didn't realize that it was. 
I was too afraid to even let anybody in this world know that there was a part of me that I had kept hidden since I was four years old. The only other person that knew it was Karen. And we kept that our secret. But as you can see, as I moved through, I became more androgynous, definitely on the female side of androgyny. And finally, in around 2011, I became aware of another issue that I had, that I occurred, and that was having some issues with alcohol. That happens an awful lot in the transgender community, where people use drugs and alcohol and other addictive processes and substances to hide that pain, to hide that issue that you're doing. Well, I got that resolved. And guess what? It gave me something else to be passionate about. And so, and so I did. And so I did it a little bit differently than most. I, I went right into my treatment program saying I didn't think I would ever want to do 12-step programs, and I didn't do a 12-step program. I went into another type of program that's science-based, and my safety net was a series of, of meetings I would go to on just once a week, and it worked for me. It worked very, very well for me. I liked it so much I became a facilitator. I now facilitate two recovery meetings each week. And how powerful that is, more so for me than probably for my participants, because I get to see the, their change. And it became another way for me to advocate in this world for helping others make change. I believe strongly that advocation, us being advocates is a way that, that we can do that. Well, finally, in 2013, Karen noticed that I was getting more and more depressed. I still wasn't happy, even with all the good changes I'd made. One of the things about getting rid of alcohol is I never, no longer had that as a crutch, so I had to start dealing with my gender issues. And she looked at me and said, it's time, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. So I started full time. And that process in itself takes uh, an awful long time. So I'd already had about 10 years that I'd been micro-transitioning, and now I knew that I had at least another two to go before I was going to be finished with the process. But when you come out, you have to live full time before you can even begin doing things. So I did. My first step in that is finding counseling. You have to have two letters in order to be able to get hormone therapy. And so I started, I talked with a psychiatrist, and you have to talk to a counselor. I had those. Uh, I went through the process necessary to, uh, to get my letters. My counselor was fantastic. She and I, for a matter of fact, we just had our last session about a year ago. So finding counseling was a relatively easy process. But the next step of the process was finding somebody who would help me with hormone therapy. I sent my personal physician an email and said, if you don't want to take this journey with me, don't respond. I never heard back. <laughs> I went to another physician that I thought would, have, would do it because they worked in a clinic that was supposed to treat everybody that was in our company. And what I got instead was a lecture. The first one was, well, no, you can't, I'm not going to do hormone therapy with you because it's do no harm, and that would harm you. And I don't recommend you getting those surgeries that you were telling me about because they're dangerous and they're going to be painful. And by the way, you won't make a very good-looking woman anyway. <laughs> and, I, and so I said, okay, well, okay, thank you. I said, I don't have the delusion that I was going to become a beautiful woman, but I do know that my brain and my body will become congruent and that I could live in this world more authentically. And I found, luckily, a fantastic physician in Charlotte, North Carolina. So it's a two-hour drive for me to get my primary care physician. But I also found somebody who had the expertise to work with me and with the therapy that I needed. And I'm very happy to say that that has changed now in the upstate. And that they're, with both of our major hospital systems in, in Greenville and in, in Spartanburg, there are physicians that will work with our community. But back just four years ago, that wasn't the case. Now, this gave me another passion, <laughs> another thing that I could get out and talk about. And it added to my story. So I was able to change my story, add to the story that I had been telling all along. And so now I get to talk with our medical schools. We have two medical schools here in the upstate, one tied to the Greenville Hospital System, the other one tied to Spartanburg, which is a DO school. And I get to talk with both of them and, 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 and 
let them know about our community and how they can serve the full LGBTQ community, not just the transgender part. I get to talk to four universities with their master's classes in clinical counseling so that they have the experience. I get to talk to high schools. I get to talk to a lot of places, and it's fantastic. And in each place, it allows us the opportunity, me and there's a few of us that do that work, the opportunity to educate. I think it was Ms. Mandela that said that our biggest weapon for change is education. And so if I can help in any way in doing that, that's my passion. And so why I'm here today is to let you know and to remind you that each of you have a passion. You each have life experiences, hurdles that you had to get over and that you did. You can have a story. You have a story that you can tell. And I want to encourage you to join organizations that are in line with your passions. Join organizations that can help you tell your story and that can give you access to the places that you need to go out and who need to hear that story. You know, back in, I was challenged and encouraged in 2008 when President Obama quoted Gandhi and said, be the change. I thought, wow, cool. Be the change. That, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. Then recently, in some interviews with David Letterman, he said, you know, if you see something that needs to be changed in this world, then it is up to each one of us to step up and do what is necessary to make that change happen. Folks, join me. Join other organizations and be the change. Peace be with you all.